as human beings, we have always been seeking ways to protect our families and our tribes. And the ways in which we protect each other have changed because of circumstances. In World War II, many, many Americans, of course, had their lives turned upside down. And my mother, who was born in 1940, moved several times as a result of World War II. Her father, Richard Henley, joined the Signal Corps. And in 1942, he moved from Lex they moved to Lexington, Kentucky, but eventually to a small town that you may have heard of before in Tennessee called Oak Ridge. And because of my grandfather's familiarity with electronics, he worked on a project called the Manhattan Project that eventually created both of the atomic bombs, which led to the end of World War II. After the end of that war in 1945, my mother and her family returned to Shreveport, Louisiana. But my mom had really bad allergies. And so my grandmother and my grandfather went on a search all across the American South to try to find a place where they could be that she would be safe. And they found Abilene, Texas. It was a town they had never been to before. They didn't have any connections. But the allergies, I guess, in Abilene aren't as bad as they are in some other places. And so they moved to that place. Well, today, I want to talk to you about courage and the ways in which we take care of each other. I took this picture about 12 years ago on a Saturday morning in our home here in Edmond. And I grew up watching cartoons on Saturday morning. Our children grew up with laptops, playing things like Club Penguin and Webkins and games like Travian, where you are working against other players to, you know, build resources. This is before Minecraft. It's a different world. And in the ensuing decade since I took that picture, we've just seen screens and technology continue to advance in more and more ways in our lives. In fact, how many of you have had the experience of not having your cell phone with you when you leave the house or the apartment in the morning? You just don't quite feel complete, right? Because this has really become part of our extended brain. But with all of this change has also come danger. And Cybercrime and cyber activity um, are, are something that we're hearing about in the news a lot. And I have a personal challenge for you. What I want you to do is, when you have an opportunity, after this talk is over, online I want you to Google, have I been pwned? Pwned is a hacker term meaning owned. And the person you see in the center of this picture is Troy Hunt. Troy is a white hat hacker, as opposed to a black hat hacker. He works for a small company called Microsoft. But in his own time, Troy has put together this website, which takes all of the data from the known breaches or hacks that have happened in the past decade plus, and allows anyone to put in an email address and see what information has been taken, what information is on the dark web. Now, you may not know what the dark web is, it is a place on the internet where a lot of illicit and criminal activity takes place. And literally, your password, most likely, if you've used the same one over and over again, as most of us have, is probably hacked and it probably is on the dark web. Now, I probably can guess what at least some of you are saying right now. Wes, I am not a technology person. In fact, when you heard the introduction that we were going to talk about technology, maybe you kind of said this one may not, this talk may not be for me. But I'm here to tell you that my topic today is not as much about technology as it is about caring for our families, caring for our loved ones, and protecting each one of us in an environment that is extremely hostile. Go to Google News, put in the word hack. Take a look at the latest news that you'll read about. Not only is this exchange server attack that has happened here in the early part of 2021 affected thousands and thousands of companies and intelligence officials tell us that probably originated with China. The solar winds attack, we kind of got through the election and thought, oh, we didn't get hacked. Oh my gosh, then what do we find out that Russian operatives have done? They have infiltrated hundreds if not thousands of businesses and also parts of the U.S. government to include the Department of State, the Department of Energy, the Department of Commerce. It's scary. And it's easy to be scared. And my message today is not be scared, be very, very scared. It's let's take some proactive steps together to address this. Because in addition to things happening with companies and governments, there's stuff happening with water systems. 
I don't know if you saw this headline in January of 2021, but a Florida community had its water system hacked, and thankfully one of the employees on staff was watching the screen as the cursor moved, and the amount of lye chemical, which helps purify the water, was increased over a hundred times. They were able to stop that in time, and there wasn't a poisoning. But our nation specifically is so open to cyber attack today, as the director of technology at our school for four years, I became incredibly aware of how many phishing attacks, that's a fish like with a PH where someone's trying to get your credentials and try to get you to give your password away. And lots of social engineering, lots of pretending to be the, the boss, pretending to be someone. It's not just the folks saying, I'm, you know, in the, I'm a Nigerian king wanting to give you, you know, lots of my riches. It's people trying to trick you in every way they can. It's part of the reason we're getting so many robocalls today, right, about insurance or car warranties or whatever. How are we going to protect our families in this era of cybercrime? I want to get really specific with you. And I know with my, I'm not a therapist, by the way, but I do like to use this term technology fear therapy. In true therapy, you don't want to give people advice, right? You want to help people discover their own their own solutions. Because part of the problem with giving advice is you can get blamed, right, if that's not going to work. So Wes is going to violate a little precept of therapy because I do want to give you specific advice. I want to go over four different things that I'm going to ask you to do if you're not doing them already, and I'm going to ask you to help other people in your family, maybe colleagues and coworkers, maybe neighbors. So let's go through them. The first thing may be the most difficult and it's to do proactive patient listening. Have you ever been stressed about resetting a password? H have you ever worked with someone who's stressed? As the director of technology at our school, the most stressful times, besides having the internet go down a few times, uh, really were when someone was having trouble with their password and they had a lot of difficulty, in part sometimes because it was an Apple system and if you've done that reset, you know it asks you to prove it's really you. They're doing that to try to prevent someone from gaining unauthorized access. It can be hard to deal with someone when they're very stressed out, right? Because emotion is high. But we can breathe deep, we can think patient thoughts, do whatever you need to get in a place where you can be patient with that person, you can listen, and you can help. But notice the first word here is proactive. Because ideally, you're not going to wait until identity theft has happened. By the way, show of hands, who has either been a victim of identity theft or you know someone who has been a victim? That number of hands keeps on going up, right? Because this is a very real thing. And this is going to be my, my next part of this. I want to encourage you, yourself, not your password, but to put your email address here into this website. I mean, what is cybercrime? Cybercrime is the theft of digital information that can also lead to changes in the, in the physical world, like taking money from your bank account or getting a loan in your name and ruining your credit. Think about what would happen if someone had access to everything on your phone today. Your email accounts, your insurance, your banking, that could be catastrophic. So the stakes are high, but how do we personalize this both for ourselves and for others? Well, when you put your email address in here, it will tell you the breaches, the date and the time of when that happened, but also what information was taken. Was your password compromised? Was your social security number? Was your birthday? Was your mother's maiden name? What kinds of information was taken? And part of the bad news I have for you, because I have good news as well, is that password that you've used a lot, because we've all probably used that password. If you've been online for any amount of time, it's probably on the dark web. And so this will tell you that. What does that mean? Don't use that password anymore. That takes us to prescription number two, secure passwords. So let's do some good news. How many of you don't like changing your password? <laughs> is anyone the IT person who has to make people change their passwords? <laughs> Here's the good news. NIST, that's one of the organizations that gives advice about passwords, actually discourages organizations today from making people change their password too frequently. Because what do you think happens when we're asked to change our password really often? We do insecure things like writing it on a sticky note and putting it on our monitor or putting it under our keyboard. 
We do things that are not smart from a safety and security standpoint. So what is a good password, Wes? I'm so glad you asked. It's a password that is unique, long, and complex. Now let's talk about that first word, unique. Wes, do you really mean I could only use that password one time on one website? Yes, I do. Why unique? It's because once a breach happens, you don't want to give people the keys to your whole kingdom, right? Because if you're using your email to log in and you're using your password, if you repeat that, guess what? There was a news article recently when Disney Plus streaming launched that people were, were oh my gosh, I'm hacked, I'm hacked. No, actually Disney Plus hadn't been hacked, but, but dark web actors, bad actors, had gotten an email and gotten a password that someone had used before, and they said, oh, let's just try that on Disney+. Plus." Look at that. They repeated their password, and that's how people were getting in. Same thing happens with Bank of America and all kinds of banking accounts. Your passwords need to be unique. Why do they need to be long? It's because the longer your password is, the harder it is to guess. I'm actually using 30-character random passwords now on every account, and they're unique. Wes, are you a genius? No, I'm not. How in the world could you do this? Complex, uppercase, lowercase, alphanumeric, special characters. There's another layer here before I get to how to do this and remain sane, and it's called multi-factor or two-factor authentication. How many of you have done this? You get a code when you log into your bank or somewhere else. Why? It's because you have to have a physical device, a second factor, of authentication besides the password to prove that you're you. I have on my keychain a little device that looks like a USB flash drive, but it's called a hardware token. And that lets me authenticate into my a new phone, into a computer. It's actually more secure. Text messaging for multi-factor is better than none, but it actually is vulnerable as well. The best thing is to use a software program that can create those codes or use a hardware token. Let's talk about password managers, okay? I want you to proudly raise your hand if today you're using some kind of password manager. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. We've got a couple hands, all right. A password manager is a software program, it can be an app, a website, where you put all of your passwords, okay? And it really is like putting all your eggs in one basket. However, Password manager companies and websites do a lot of things to make sure those passwords are not compromised. And what I want to encourage you to do is, again, go to the web, go to Google, and put in those three words, best password manager, and then turn to your trusted websites that you turn to for news and especially technology news. What do they say? Because these things will change over time. A password manager, I firmly believe, is the only way we could remain sane and secure today because having a little formula or recipe for remembering your password, I have hundreds of passwords that I had as a technology director at our school, and we have hundreds in our family as well. I don't have to remember all those. What I do have to do is remember my master password and also have the device that verifies my identity when I log in. So, number four, regular digital hygiene. Now, this may sound a little unusual, but here's what I'm talking about. Every year, at least, you should be erasing everything that's on your phone or your computer after you've backed it up. Why would I say that? Because people are trying to install malware, bad software, on our devices all the time. And if that scares you, I have good news. Again, think of the person in your life who is your tech go-to person. Now, I'm kind of that person in my family. Who do you go to when you can't figure this out? Have them help you back up your stuff and then erase what you have. That's really the only way. You can have antivirus software and things like that to scan, but really there's no complete protection besides completely erasing it and then reinstalling your operating system. So what are the next steps? And you probably knew this was coming. I'm getting personal. I'm asking you to do these four things. I want you to go to haveibeenpwned.com, take a look at how many breaches your email, and you probably have more than one email you've used in the past decade. How many breaches has that been used and compromised in, and what information have the bad guys been able to get? Because it's for sale today, right? It is literally being sold today. Who knows how many people have bought 
that old password that you've used so many times. I want you to change all of your repeated passwords. <laughs> Wes, how am I gonna do that? Because a password manager is gonna help you. In fact, modern password managers today will help identify when you've repeated a password and which ones are weak, not very strong, and then the ones that are even breached. So you really need to change those right away. Use that password manager and then think about how on some kind of a regular basis, you know, at home, we change the smoke alarm batteries, right? That's just something we do. Our HVAC systems, our heater air conditioner, you gotta change the filter, right? It's just something that you do. This is part of living in the digital world. Living in this environment and keeping ourselves safe and our family safe mean doing some different things. The next thing is to schedule some conversations. How many of you had that conversation with your family about what you want to have happen when you pass away, right? Because, you know, newsflash, we're all going to die. We need to have conversations about what happens with our digital life as well as our physical life, our physical materials, our physical... Um, things that we own. It's like estate planning, okay? Put it on the calendar. Maybe you'll do this at a holiday, maybe you'll do it on a weekend, but schedule those conversations with family members because this is important. This is about protecting your family. If I could help just one of you avoid the terrible consequences of identity theft because of the message you're hearing today, I'll be so excited. And the good news is, you don't have to go get a certification to become a technology fear therapist. I'm commissioning you today in like two minutes to go forth and do this, all right? Number three, I want you to practice patient listening and dialogue. And this is hard for, for some of us. It, it, it can be really difficult, especially when people are stressed. But it's so important to listen, especially as people are fearful, because there is a lot of fear that surrounds this, and you may be having a conversation with someone who has been the victim of identity theft. So practice that patient listening. My father's father died of a heart attack when I was just a few months old, but this is a picture of me, very young, with my mom's mom, Richard Henley, who with my grandmother made that decision back in 1945 to move to Abilene, Texas. I didn't have a chance to say thank you, because I didn't know about that when he was alive, but I really appreciate the fact that he was courageous and my grandmother was courageous and they did the right thing to protect their family, to think about wellness and to think about the future of my mother. And in the same way, I wanna commission you to go forth and be a technology fear therapist for your family. Thank you.